on today's show. What seed are you? We try to make sense of the crazy Western Conference standings. In Crossfire, we debate the biggest trend of the NBA season. And in the up-down report, we explain why the Knicks can't even tank properly. Uh, give them a break. It's Tuesday, April 14th. The starter starts now. Good evening, sweet world, and welcome to the starters. Whether you're joining us live online, you're listening to the podcast, or you're catching us on NBA TV, we're very, very happy to have you. I'm Jay Skeets, and alongside me, as always, that's Tass Mellis. Four more sleeps. We'll take it a quarter at a time. To my right, starters blog editor, Trey Kirby. Hey, hey yo! And finally, the international man of mystery, taking it to the max, Lee Ellis. Amigos. Mm, Lele. Lele, all right, fun Tuesday show. We've got Crossfire. We've got the up-down report. But we're starting with lessons learned. It was a busy NBA schedule last night. Our first lesson learned, though, we don't know anything. (laughs) The Western Conference is an absolute mess. It's going to take all 82 games to decide whether the Pelicans or the Thunder make it into the playoffs. That's how it should be. But we're still trying to figure out the 8th and ninth seed. We don't even know who's going to be anywhere from 2 to 6. You had Russell Westbrook. Doing his part, you know, after the league rescinded his 16th technical, he goes out there, helps him team get the win. The Pelicans also doing their part. I mean, look, Russ, game high 36, 11 boards, 7 assists. They beat up on the Blazers by 11. The Pelicans, I said, they stay in the tie there for that 8th position, and they have the tiebreaker. Anthony Davis, 24 and 11, bunch of blocks. They beat up on the Wolves. Back to the Blazers, though. Two. Key guys, more wing contributors going down. Nicholas Batum and C.J. McCollum. Yeah, C.J. McCollum, who's only playing because Wesley Matthews went down. Aaron Aflalo also goes down. C.J. looking great, and now he's down. Still yet to know the updates on those two guys. With the Warriors, Clay Thompson caught fire in a quarter again. Not as crazy as 37, but dropping 26-42 overall. The Warriors beat the Grizzlies, which is huge because it drops Memphis way down in the standings. And then sort of in the late game, the Clippers rallied to beat the Nuggets, and they pulled themselves into a three-way tie with the Spurs and Rockets. Everyone breathe. Again, parody. all of these games, and in the end, we still don't have an actual matchup decided as we head into the playoffs on Saturday. We've highlighted the three teams that we know where they are. Yes. We know the Warriors are the number one seed, that's obvious. We know the Blazers are the fourth seed. They're not gonna have home court advantage in the first round. And we, th- and we know the Mavs are the seventh seed. Otherwise, absolutely everything is up in the air here. Yeah, and it's odd because the Grizzlies held that second seed for three months. We all thought, oh, the Spurs, are they over the hill? You know, they didn't start off too well, 21 and 15, but since they're on fire, 34 and 11, and they can finish second with a victory over those Pelicans. They're, well, they've won 11 straight. It's gonna be really tough for the Pelicans to beat them, I think, on Wednesday night. Everything's still up in the air. Yeah, that's the one thing that's, if you're a Thunder fan, it sort of sucks because you're like, okay, look, the Pelicans are going to play the Spurs, and maybe any other year, uh, the Spurs would probably be looking at resting guys. Yeah. You're going in there, maybe getting an easy one, but because of what we just showed you, the Spurs, the Spurs are still playing for that number two seed mm-hmm. with the worry that they could technically, unlikely, but technically still fall to six. So. It's not going to be easy. Yeah, that loss last night by the Grizzlies certainly helped the Spurs out in that respect. But San Antonio, I mean, this is the team that you mentioned. Like, every year you kind of write them off, and they started off much slower than usual. Tony Parker really had a rough December and January. But since then, they've just got it together, and they are now looking like the favourite. And and hopefully we do at least now get that possible matchup in the Western Conference Finals where it's going to be San Antonio and Golden State, and not before then, because that one was what we discussed before, that maybe we'd feel a little bit short-changed if we saw them in the conference uh, semi-finals rather than the finals. So if things play out the way they go and they finish one and two, we may see that, which is good for basketball fans. Yeah, the one thing that's crazy too with this Thunder Pelicans matchup is that in the end, again, if they're tied, the tiebreaker goes to New Orleans and it could be all because of an Anthony Davis game winner against this team. And that's kind of how it should be to me. He's been the best player for their team. He's going to be the best player in the league pretty soon. And I think it's pretty cool that actually deciding his first playoff spot could come down to hitting (laughs) one of his first game winners of his career, especially a crazy legs flailing one like this from three. uh, (laughs) Swish bomb. (laughs) I I am, you know, in the end, I don't really care if it's the Thunder or the Pelicans in in the playoffs because I don't think either of them are going to beat the Warriors. And look, they're both great teams. You know, the Thunder, of course, ravaged by injuries. But the more and more we get closer here and and you see things like that, I sort of do want Anthony Davis to get into the playoffs. I know it's something we've talked about a bit before because I like the ideas of young superstars 
getting in some playoff reps. Mm -hmm. Even if it is a simple four, five, six game series against the Warriors and, and you lose, it's sort of nice to get those reps in as a young guy. It actually reminds me a little bit of the Thunder, ironically, back when, what, Westbrook was 21, yeah. Grant was 21, and they got in there and they played the Lakers in 2010. They took it to six games. It was actually a fairly tight series. Yeah. Very, yeah. And of course, the next year went to the conference finals. The year after that went to the finals. It's, I just like those reps for, again, your young superstars. Yeah, you learned the difference because we were having some laughs at the beginning of the season. Kyrie Irving in the second game of the year asking, is this what the playoffs are like? You don't know until you're there. Right. And that's why it's going to be good for Anthony Davis to get there, just get some reps. But by the time he's actually the best player in the league and he's got a team around him that can really support him, he'll know what to do when he gets to the playoffs. And remember, the Pelicans actually just had a really good win over the Golden State Warriors. Now, again, I know that things are completely different in the playoffs, but they would feel some sort of confidence knowing that Anthony Davis is quite a difficult guy to defend at the best of times. But what makes the the Golden State Warriors defense, especially with Andrew Bogut, effective is he's a good rim protector, but when Anthony Davis is stepping out and knocking down those 15, 20 foot jumpers, it makes it very, very difficult to defend. So again, I don't think the, the Pelicans would win that series, but absolutely they could win a game. And, and just to see the sort of domination that Anthony Davis could put on at both ends of the floor would be great for fans to see. So Tuesday night here, we don't know one single matchup that we're eventually going to see in the playoffs. It'll all be decided by the end of Wednesday night. But on Thursday, once we do know, we're going to have an hour-long playoff preview. We're going to jump on here. We're going to break down the series. We're going to make our predictions for each series. So you want to check that on Thursday, again, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, hour-long show. Always probably one of my favorite shows yeah. of the season. Especially you, the predictions part of it. Yeah, when you really get to <laughs> look at the, the matchups, try and figure out yeah. uh, where one team has the advantage, and then make our predictions. That's on Thursday. Next lesson learned. Jumping over to the East. Lesson learned, the Brooklyn Nets... They just don't want to make the playoffs. They don't care to try and clinch a playoff position. I mean, after months of pretty solid basketball, two now stinkers in a row that they've just given up and really lost control of their playoff fate. Well, they're just not a very good basketball team at home. Uh, the last 10 games before these couple, yeah, they were good. They put together a little bit of streak, but uh, it's just been such a bad season. Mm. And they couldn't bail themselves out with a good couple weeks. What's crazy about them is they have a better road record than they do a home record. They huh. really, really struggle at home. Their fans can't seem to get noise, noise going. Maybe it's because Jay-Z built that arena for music and not for the reverberation of fans cheering. It's just too quiet in Barclays, but they're on the verge of being extinct. Yeah, they, they really just handed the Pacers a second life yeah. here. Again, oh, they had put together a nice run. I think, uh, in fact, I came on the show one day and said, you know, what, three weeks ago, I said, oh, I hope the Brooklyn Nets don't make the playoffs. Yeah. Then they went on a tear, and it looked like they were going in here, but they lose to the Bulls. Before that, a real stinker to the, to the Milwaukee Bucks. Two really winnable games, and now they're suddenly having to hope that the Pacers actually lose one of their last games. Yeah, but Kevin Garnett's gone, Paul Pierce is gone. They just don't really have a vocal leader that's around there. Now they're kind of the same group that 2013 folded in Game 7 at home against the Bulls. Against the Bulls. They just don't have anybody who's going to put the team on their back and said, this is what we're doing, we're not losing this game. They've got a lot of guys who just like to play iso ball and try and get some shots up. It's just not much of a team, and I'm also with you, Skeets. I'm kind of hoping they're the team left out. Yeah, they're just not pretty to watch. Uh, Joe Johnson, though, an experienced guy like him, you would have felt that he would have been at least able to carry this team because he is a big-time performer. But even he's kind of just sort of like, meh, whatever. It doesn't, they don't seem to be really, really motivated and driven to get in there, especially when it's so open because Indiana's had a lot of problems. The Celtics now, they've, they've done really well over the last six weeks to get themselves in. But there was an opportunity for the Nets to maybe get into sixth perhaps, in sure. the Eastern Conference, and they just kind of didn't seem to even be that motivated or driven to do it. Like, we're looking at Joe the... didn't have any help. You know, no, I, he I, didn't. No, but he, he, he... We all sort of blame Joe Johnson, it feels like, in years past, and he's not the guy to, to put a team on his back. He needs some help. Yeah, but he in, didn't get it. Yeah, in the past, though, he's the sort of guy who I would say you can you can Fourth rely quarter, on him sure. to deliver a couple of wins. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a bad, bad season for them. Again, these losses to the Bucks and Bulls, yeah. these weren't close games. Ah, yeah. It wasn't oh. it wasn't a bad bounce here or there. They just got killed right out of That's the game. That's why I was confused. Lionel games. Holland said it doesn't matter how you lose after the game, which <laughs> was very confusing. I mean, their team didn't show yeah. up. Interesting to yeah. see if he's coaching next season. Yeah. All right, final uh, lesson learned here. I hope you caught this on the Jazz broadcast last night. Jazz color commentator. Matt Harpering does not like Vegemite, Lee. I know this might it. upset you. The, the cameras caught him trying out the uh, Australian dark brown food. <laughs> <laughs> a, pa a paste made of leftover brewer's yeast extract. <laughs> mm. And uh, like most people, 
Yeah. Harper, well, well, Harper well, not feeling it. Yeah. Listen, he's giving it a tiny, tiny amount on his finger. You've got to really dip your finger right in there and get a good chunk of it on uh, there. Look, he's trying Is that the preferred it. way to eat it? Yeah, finger? yeah. You don't just go like for a little dab. You really dig into it. So, so there's a, in Australia, you grew up on this. Yeah. You have it all. What do you eat this every? I actually oh my have God! <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I keep some on me just in case something like this pops up. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> now look. You keep it. Vegemite on yeah. you at all well, times. You, never, you just never know when you're going to need it. Now this is the problem, right? Oh, Matt Harper no, did a. It's oozing out. He did it. It's like <laughs> it, it doesn't actually normally come in a toothpaste-like container, but still, it's the same. So you yeah. got to put a good. <laughs> oh come on! on. I can, like that. I can it looks like a worm, right? Yeah, well, it does actually look like a worm when it squeezes out. But I then can literally like, smell it from here. Oh, oh look at him! He loves it. Mm. Try, try it, Tess. Go for it, Tess. Now give yourself a good hearty mouthful. Have you ever had it? It's obviously not. Uh, it's mm. horrible. It's in a tube. It's why fine, would I yeah. eat anything in a go, tube? Go, Whoa, go. That's, you really the, way. Gotta That's the way. Good stuff. It's rich in vitamin B, they tell now, me. Don't give yourself a chance to spit it out. Just swallow it. Swallow That's it. That's the thing swallow. I'm looking forward to is the vitamin down. B person. Yeah, it's horrible. Good stuff. Good stuff. Oh. Now, why do people eat this though? Well, look, oh. normally you have it on a piece of toast mm. with butter and it's all <laughs> melting on there. But, like you don't normally just have <laughs> scoops of it, but uh, it's fine. It's good. Oh. So Matt Harper, next time you have some, I wanted, okay. to, I wanted to put a no, big, uh, big so chunk. More you eat, the more you eat, it yeah. really grows big? on you. I'm right, literally tearing up. Uh, 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 <laughs> I bet either would love it, right? I'd rather yeah, have sure. my teeth pulled out than do that again. Uh, when we come back, Taz and I will go head to head in Crossfire. Can we get some water? This is horrible. <laughs> Welcome to Crossfire. If you're new to the show, this is how it works. Trey will give Skeets and me three topics. Skeets and I will debate each one. At the end of it all, Trey will declare a winner. Trey, what is our first topic today? Well, it's the end of the season, so we've got a few loose awards to hang out, to hand out, and I'll give you a real award first. Who is your executive of the year this season? It's David Griffin of the Cleveland Cavaliers. I mean, when he announced that LeBron James was coming back the first night of Summer League, he basically won it then. But then he went and grabbed Kevin Love, 26 and 12 last year. Then he got Mike Miller and James Jones. That should have been the cherry on the cake. Well, we thought, okay, that's it. It's gonna take time to build a well-rounded team around those guys. No, nope. he went and got a starting center in Moscow, a starting shooting guard in J.R. Smith, a backup shooting guard. He got eight rotation players since the beginning of the summer. Fantastic, overcame Anderson Verajas injury, it's him. He made some moves, but maybe LeBron James is the real executive of the year. Ah, ah, tandem there. Ah, I'm gonna ah. go, I'm gonna go with Bob Myers with the Warriors for a couple of things, two things really. First, he lets go of Mark Jackson, a guy who took him to 50 wins and replaces him with Steve Kerr and a great assistant coaches around him. But the best move he may have made was the one he didn't, and that was not trading Clay Thompson for who you just said, Kevin Love. A lot of people were like, you're crazy, you got to do that. He looked back, he stepped back and said, no, they like the progress of where Clay's headed. And I mean, Clay and Steph, I mean, that was the right move. So I go with Bob Myers. Bob Myers will get some Kevin Love for that award. Next Topic one. Two. We all know the MVP is going to come down to Steph Curry and James Harden, but who has been this season's least improved player? Oh, I hate to do it because I feel like we're doing this every second week here on the show, but I will pile on Lance Stevenson with the Charlotte Hornets. Oh, no. Again. Sorry, oh, no. Sorry, Lance. I mean, look, I, look I, we thought because he was going to become a focal part of the offense that he would grow as a player, and the exact opposite has happened there with the Hornets. He's shooting 37% from the floor, 17% from three. It's been very, very bad. Again, a promising looking young guy has just tanked. I don't know how it's not Lance Stevenson. It is a good one. The least improved player for me is a player that everyone hates to see in their box score. That's DNP injury. We have been ravaged by injuries this season and I'm usually a positive Pete, trying to look back and, and see that, oh, we've always had injuries, but this year it's been terrible. Kobe, Durant, Surge have taken OKC out of the playoff mix. Chris Bosh is out. Jabari Parker, Milwaukee Bucks, a great story. Imagine if they had Jabari Parker in the lineup. So many rookies with Julius Randle out. I looked through and by my count, two thirds of the teams, 21 of 30 teams have had a major injury this season. It's been extremely bad. Even guys who've come back like, like Paul George, that's they're not, they're so not your, gonna factor. Your least improved player is a line in the box score. That's right, yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Way to think outside that's the right. box, All right. All right, topic number three. 
Pace and space, cool hats, baseline reverse dunks. What's this season's trend of the year? All of those are good. I'm gonna go with one I think we've seen coming for a while now, but it's the center position and how centers become more and more just defensive minded. You do not need a 2010 guy that goes to work on the block and you pound it in there. Yeah, there are a handful of them, like DeMarcus Cousins and maybe even Al Jefferson, but you really don't need one. You see it with Andrew Bogut and the impact he has had on a team. Timothy Mozgov coming over to the Cavs, you already said, and then guys like Rudy Gobert and DeAndre Jordan. I just think the focus on your center playing defense is really where this league is going. I'll give you the real trend of the year. It's teams resting players. This has been brewing forever. The best coach in the league has done it forever, and Greg Popovich sitting guys now. Teams are just copying it. You see it around the league, and it's become such an epidemic that teams like the Denver Nuggets, who aren't in the playoffs, they are headed for the lottery, are sitting teams. Everyone has done it. It's becoming more and more of a problem, but it's understandable that guys need the rest. We talked to players. My first interview in this league was Tony Parker while eating a Subway sandwich. He scoffed at me when I suggested that he partake in a one-on-one -on -one tournament at All-Star Week, and he said, no, we already do too right. much. It's understandable that guys sit. Did he have a Vegemite on that sandwich? Never. No. All right, who won this? That. Skeets is your winner today because Tass made me sad with all those injuries. Yeah, Sorry no. about that. Very depressing. All right, we got to take a break. When we come back, thumbs up or thumbs down on the Knicks suddenly winning games. They can't even tank correctly. Come on back. Welcome back to the starters into the up down report where the four of us figure out where we stand on some hot button NBA topics. We ask you to do the same at home. Jump on Twitter, hashtag the starters, thumbs up or thumbs down. First one, guys. Thumbs up or thumbs down on the Knicks suddenly winning basketball games again. They've won two straight, and as a result are actually hurting their chances at the possibility of finishing with the NBA's worst record, and as a result, the best shot at the number one pick. We got a split table here. Lee and I, thumbs down. Trey and Tess, thumbs up. Everyone always says that players don't tank. It's organizations that do. So this is what's going to happen when you send NBA players out there to play an NBA basketball game. And maybe it's good for karma for the Knicks because the worst team in the league hasn't got the top pick since 2004. So maybe they're appeasing the basketball gods. <laughs> they will look down kindly upon the Knicks and gift them with the number one overall pick. Normally, I'm all for winning and positivity because I think that's very important. But they've been torturing their fans all season long and they had a chance to really take the, the best chance of getting that number one pick, and now they've reduced that by these two wins. Why weren't they playing like this, this throughout the season? Why was their effort so lackadaisical, and now they start playing and competing, and they're actually hurting their own chances? I think they should have just somehow found a way to just play the way they were playing and mail this You don't money. like building a winning culture I do, Paul but, Aldrich? I do, but not with only two or three games left in the season. <laughs> and, and that's just it. They're drastically, drastically hurting their chances at the number one pick. And they're not done yet. You know, it's a possibility of sort of passing, if you want to call it that. The Sixers <laughs> there in terms of tanking. Oh, yeah. Uh, but going from 25%, because they did have the worst record before these two wins, and the Wolves, hey, they're doing it right. They've lost something like 11 straight here. But yeah, that's, I, wouldn't uh, go, I wouldn't go drastically. Well, because, because, yeah, they dropped 5%. Possibly in the end? Well, I mean, as Trey said, the number one team rarely does. 87% okay. of the time, it's more likely that a two, three, or four wins. So maybe they're increasing their chances. By <laughs> Listen, they, they can't win. We rip them when they lose. We rip them when they win. Uh -huh. yeah, it's the joy we should of be the ripping game. the Hawks for losing to Don't the New York. Laying an egg. All right, yeah. next one here. Up or down, guys, on the new Milwaukee Bucks logos. Yes, and I'm pluralizing that because they unveiled three new logos at the Bradley Center during halftime of the Bucks and Sixers game. You see the first one there? Yeah, much, much more aggressive looking Milwaukee Buck. And then your secondary and your tertiary logos are, are, are fairly unique. Mm -hmm. I think we can call them that. You guys are all thumbs up on this. Yeah. I'm thumbs down. I'll explain that in a reason, but you guys like these. I think the color scheme is really cool. We know that the Bucks are a green team. They're not a Christmas team anymore. The cream is super <laughs> unique because nobody else has it. The font is cool. I'm not a huge fan of the M they have, but everything else in general, I think it's turned out pretty well. They got the cream. That sounds got cool. The that just sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, how could you be sounds down like on that? I'll tell you why I'm down. I actually don't mind the logos. It looks awesome. But I'm down on how they presented this uh, right. last night because, first off, they did it not at, during a home game. They were playing in Philadelphia and had a viewing party, so they did it there. I found that a little weird. But then they had these three artists speed paint the logos, 
which was fine, but the weird part was the classic rock band, this cover band here. Who's that, Gnarls Barkley? They were, si <laughs> they were singing Journeys Don't Stop Believing while they were painting those. Thumbs down for that Which song. totally clashes <laughs> with the hashtag own the future that the Bucks keep trying to throw on. You us. gotta pick one slogan, I guess. <laughs> are you going with 1981 and Journey, or are we going with Own the Future? That's uh, what I was confused about. Music always comes back in style, so maybe they're just trying to catch it. It's a bit of an old school look. That song already did come back in style yeah. with the Sopranos there. All right, next one, let's hear what you guys think. Up or down on Brandon Jennings saying Chris Brown is more talented than Michael Jackson. He tweeted this early Sunday morning right there. He says, quote, I believe Chris Brown is way more talented than Michael Jackson. Only thing that stopped that was stuff outside of music. Yeah, yeah. well, Michael Jackson never had any controversy outside of music. <laughs> no. uh, listen, You're right. Brandon Jennings may as well have tweeted that he is more talented than Michael Jordan. It's the same thing, but uh, yeah. he should have deleted that tweet. It's a, a bad tweet. There are no words for that. Just let it go. I mean, you're a Rihanna fan, so obviously mm. you don't like Chris Brown. That's fair. That's uh, yeah. I would print that tweet and put it up as uh, with the worst of the year banners, because that's ridiculous. <laughs> Sorry, idea. final one here, guys. Uh, the NBA's new sponsorship deal with PepsiCo. Yes, they're done with Coke. They're going with Pepsi. And they announced the deal on Monday. So PepsiCo brings with it, you know, the power of their brands. You got Pepsi, Lay's, Lipton, Doritos, Ruffles, Mountain Dew, and so on. So no longer the Sprite Slam dunk contest. Right. Instead, we are thumbs up. This is for you, Adam Silver. We're thumbs up on the Pepsi products. Yeah. It looks so, so good. Give me some Vegemite, uh, Give me some Vegemite, yeah. I'm willing to put <laughs> suntan lotion on my chips. <laughs> That's a good partnership right there. Now, get some Vegemite on there. Yummy! Uh, we're, we're sellout. <laughs> we're a complete sellout. <laughs> I can't even talk. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to the starters. It must be all that Vegemite, because Lee Ellis is on fire in the April Pick'em Payoff contest with Trey. Another perfect night for Lee, 5-0. and Trey goes 2-3. and So it is technically over. And that means tomorrow, the bearded one, Trey Kirby, is going to get a nice pie to the face of the Mrs. Doubtfire Payoff. Lee will get to... Uh, Get revenge yeah. last season. It's been a long 12 months. I'm looking forward to it. So, Take it easy on this face. <laughs> so it's already over. Yeah. But you're on so much fire here. I want to know who you're taking tonight. I want you to go 30 and 3 here for this short month. And you guys agree on these games. So yeah. this makes sense. You got the Celtics, the Pacers, and the Clippers. I just said, give me what Lee's having because he'll never miss. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Impressive yeah. stuff there, Lee. Where are we going for very solid play tonight? We are going to Philadelphia of all places, and I want to see a little test with you guys, if you can name all the players who are involved in the play here. Oh, what the Furk? That's Furk yes, and Alder very here. good test. Bobby That's Cole. Bob Covington. That's Bob. Ish Smith. And who finishes it off? Javel McGee. Not quite. His father played for the Mil uh, Milwaukee Bucks and for the Philadelphia Oh, 76ers. Glenn. The big dog himself, Glenn Robinson. That's Little Dog. Yeah, Little, little dog. Bow Wow. And that's what I call a very solid play. There it is. He goes by Bow Wow now, Lee. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, all right, only three games on. You saw there tonight, but we'll be back tomorrow to break down those games, any of the big storylines, and set it up for the final night of the regular season tomorrow on Wednesday. See you at 6.30 p.m. Eastern here on NBA TV. Thanks for joining us, folks. And remember, when in doubt about sending a tweet, don't tweet that tweet at all. Brace the night, people.